Good morning. Welcome to the first symposium of the day. The maintaining the equilibrium of internal environment is a great challenge. It is called homeostasis. Thermoregulation, fluid and electrolyte balance, and acid-base balance are important in this contest. A physician should have a thorough knowledge about these factors, which are largely invisible. Therefore, it is not just treating disease per se. You will need a wide clinical knowledge and a great sense of logic when treating a patient. Specialists in internal medicine who treat patients in a holistic manner should have a broad understanding of the internal milieu of whom they treat. What else? So appropriate in this scenario. As the opening symposium of the annual academic sessions of internal medicine, SIMCON 2018, three eminent speakers will share their expertise at this symposium on metabolic derangement in medical patients, focusing on their field of interest. At the end of the symposium, you'll be given a chance to ask questions. I kindly request from all three speakers to stick to their time limits. Without further ado, to open up this intellectual conversation, let us invite Dr. Kersi Islam to talk on vitamin D deficiency and its uh, relevance to clinical medicine. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very distinguished guest, and it's my pleasure to be here as uh, the SCP ambassador from Bangladesh chapter. Uh, this is a very current hot issue globally. So vitamin D deficiency, current status, and its impact in clinical medicine, I will talk on this. 40 years old lady complaining of aches and pains and limbs uh, and difficulty in raising from the squat position in the washroom. She used to wear veil for 15 years. Her body weight is 49 kg and mildly anemic. No other positive findings were detected. Her husband is staying abroad. She has got two child children. All routine examination was normal, so she was diagnosed as uh, suffering from anxiety, depression, so treated with anxiolytic. There was no benefit. Her vitamin D level was found to be 11.1 nanogram per ml. A 45 years old gentleman uh, is a corporate executive working in the AC room, neighbor goes to the sun. He complains of fatigue, aches and pain all over the body for the last uh, few months, non-diabetic, non-hypertensive. He did uh, all the routine examination on normal, took some NSAID, flupanthixol, melitracin, without benefit. And the vitamin D level was found to be 12.2 nanogram per ml. Correction of this low vitamin D status improved the condition dramatically. So, ladies and gentlemen, these two clinical vanities shows us that this was a wonderful Examples of vitamin D deficiency in all sexes, in all disciplines of life, and every sphere of life. If you go through uh, the website, you will see 100,000 and above cases, studies, researches, and so many things. So I will talk on many topics, but I will try to keep on uh, my time. This is the sunbathing hormone, and Actually, Elmer and uh, Adolf, they are the two main people. What is the form and source of vitamin D? And uh, these are the two things. One is coming from the food, and that is the dietary one, and one is coming from the sun, or it is the ultraviolet B radiation, as you know this. This is very, very important, but the active form is 125-dihydroxycholicalciferol or calcitriol. That is the important issue. So the sources are food. Only can give you 10 to 30% depending on the fortification. And this is uh, 
totally not sufficient for human health. So sun exposure is the main issue. And 70 to 90 percent is being actually done from the sun. And through our, through, from our skin, it starts. You know this, so I will not go into the detail. So the global, uh, if you see the global situation, this is like this. Uh, where it is not present, where? Where there is sun, whereas there is no sun, uh, less sun sunlight, every parts of the world, there is enormous number of cases. So uh, almost 50% of the global population, they have been suffering from either insufficiency or deficiency. One billion people uh, worldwide across of all age groups of vitamin D deficiency. So uh, if we go, uh, we can see that uh, almost 40 to 100 percent of the U.S. and European elderly men and women, they are suffering. Postmenopausal, almost 50 percent. Uh, geriatric group, almost 56 percent. Infants in China, 42 percent. Adolescent in different age group, but mostly the older age group in Chinese, they are suffering almost 85 uh, percent. Also, the Malay versus Chinese, there are some, there are some other uh, relations, but we can say that vitamin D deficiency is a global burden for, uh, for us. If you see, the gender-wise in India, uh, the male-female is almost same. Uh, if you see in Bangladesh, the pregnant women are deficient almost 80%. If you see, uh, also in India, it is 84%. In Sri Lanka, you can see uh, it is 40% ahead, but high prevalence uh, for some factors. Some study uh, recently, it uh, published in 2015, they are telling, you can see, that uh, almost deficiency in 57% and insufficiency in 31%. So if you combine this together, it is almost 80% plus. So these are another one. In 2018, it is published from Sri Lanka. This is in this place. There are 62% if you combine these two together. So in Bangladesh, uh, there was one study. And it has been shown uh, that almost two-thirds of the people, they do not know. They are not aware that sun exposure can give them. Despite a lot of sun in my country, they are not aware that sun exposure can give vitamin D to them. So what are the factors that causes the hindrance? Uh, only 20 to 30 minutes every day in the sun can make very good amount of vitamin D uh, for a person, but we are not actually uh, aware of it. These are the environmental factors. You can see uh, during the summer and the winter, when the sun uh, is declining, the ultraviolet ray also decreasing in the winter season. So the, these are very important issues. Smokes, that is the climate change and all other things. These are important patient-related factors. Clothing cover, use of sunblock, colored skin. So pigmented skin, the ultraviolet b ray cannot enter properly into the skin. Obesity. It's a very important issue, and when the elasticity of the skin is lost, that is the aging. Very important, uh, it is uh, the more you expose to sun, the more vitamin D will produce, but obviously we should do it very cautiously because excess exposure can do some harm and can cause the skin cancer. So functions and association, as you know, this is the path. I am not taking any class over here, so this is just for the presentation's sake, a slide that how this metabolism of calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D is taking, parathormone is working like that. But if you check that uh, the deficiency is less than 10 nanogram and 10 to 30, there is insufficiency and 30 and above. And this causes, in one picture you can see, sleep changes, fatigue, pale skin, recurrent infection, cough, cold, muscle strain, and so many things. We know about the bone health related to vitamin D. This is up-to-date conception of ours. But actually, this is just on the tip of the iceberg that 
We know vitamin D deficiency causes rickets in the children and astomalacia in case of adult. But there are a lot of other diseases which we do not see, we do not know. The long list is there. So I will discuss on the clinical aspects of that. Uh, some study, some studies they have say, says just the important point. This is a, a study in Korea. In low vitamin D, there is high risk of development of hypertension. Uh, and uh, this is uh, very important. Vitamin D is associated with uh, cardiovas uh, cerebrovascular diseases. And you can see the, it is cardiovascular hazards and vitamin D is very much important. And this is also published in a journal in Circulation 2008. Uh, it is almost established that vitamin D and diabetes. Uh, there are a lot of uh, publication. I have mentioned only two. And it is very important that good supplementation possibly may prevent vitamin D, defic uh, D deficiency. If can be corrected, uh, cancer might have been prevented like that. Uh, this is another cohort study. Uh, there is risk of colorectal cancer in vitamin D deficiency. Also the same, prostate cancer, breast cancer. So a lot of cancers and vitamin D correlation, but it is not established that vitamin D deficiency causes cancer, but they, there is correlation between these two factors. Uh, very common, vitamin D uh, deficiency and uh, respiratory tract infection. Uh, many uh, research uh, has already been done. The next one, the tuberculosis, it is 4.5 times more likely when vitamin D deficiency is there, and there is a chance that people might develop uh, tuberculosis uh, in any parts, mostly in the pulmonary. Uh, very important is pregnancy. Vitamin D and pregnancy is very much related, especially the preeclampsia, uh, mostly. And there are some other uh, studies that caesarean section is also very important part if there is vitamin D de uh, deficiency, caesarean section is needed for those people than that of the normal delivery. So uh, you can see that it increased almost fivefold. The uh, latest study in 2017, this is a double-blind uh, placebo-controlled randomized controlled trial study. This is also saying the same st story. Vitamin D and infertility. Uh, this is also established nowadays, and there are publications. And also the fetal growth. If there is deficiency of vitamin D of the mother, the fetal growth will be lower. And obviously, uh, this is published in the journal well ahead, but nowadays they are also working on it again. Low birth weight is another issue. Uh, bronchial asthma from the childhood is related to the vitamin D deficiency. Very important is vitamin D deficiency and the brain. So there are so many things in the study, but uh, one important issue is the uh, vitamin D deficiency with Alzheimer's. They are telling about dementia, depression, and so many things, and also the seasonal affective uh, disorder. If I go through all, the important issue is total, if you see, the disease burden is huge in number. The lower the vitamin D, the more the disease that is shown in the slide. And uh, who will suffer from what, uh, it is not predicted. Uh, but you can assume. Uh, what expert says about, so everybody should be screening uh, for vitamin D. We are here in this hall. We should uh, uh, do our vitamin D. Obviously not. Uh, this is not supported that everybody should be screened for vitamin D. When there is symptom, only then you will go for this. Uh, so whom you will screen? The, the long list. But at, at least we should remember that there the people who are homebound, the people who are at menopause, Nowadays, uh, you have seen in the uh, textbook of Davidson that uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, the people are suffering from 
uh, they have the low vitamin D deficiency, uh, vitamin D. So some of this list will fit and then you think. And the person who are getting some drugs that can cause. So this is very important. I will go a little bit rapid because uh, time is important. Uh, you can see uh, that uh, this is called deficient. Uh, if it is 0 to 11, then 11 to 20, and 20 to 30 and above, you can see that uh, this is important and for, your, for your knowledge and for detection of a patient. Uh, the optimal, uh, you know, that some people uh, make it a nanomole. If you divide nanomole by 2.5, you will get the nanogram. So it is very easy to calculate. They are the high risk people, know the elderly people, and uh, obese, I told it before. Regarding management, few words. Uh, some people uh, think that uh, taking vitamin D supplement uh, might uh, develop uh, some toxicity. This is erroneous. No, never. Uh, usually it does not occur in a therapeutic dose. Never it occurs. So sometimes people they think about that first soluble vitamin, if I take for a long time, I might develop toxicity. So th this is less chance. It has been established by uh, doing some lot of uh, researches that long time high dose, that is a different issue. But uh, if you take the judicious dose, there will be no problem. There are some advice. Uh, facts about the vitamin D supplementation, one should be very careful. Uh, you should know the nature and severity of the disease. Uh, the natural you know, that you can go to the sun for 25 min uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and you can prevent it. That is the most important issue. Sri Lanka has got a lot of sun, so there should not be uh, vitamin D deficiency in Sri Lanka, in Bangladesh. Uh, but uh, in UK, uh, many uh, months and days, there is no sun. So when there is sun, in USA and UK, the people run to the sea beach to get the sun. That is the important thing that we should keep in mind. And 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times uh, in a week. That's the most important uh, thing that you can do. Uh, for supplementation, in pregnancy, you must give the supplementation properly. That is a very important issue because uh, there is one saying, worrying about vitamin D toxicity is like worrying about drowning when you are dying of thirst. This is from John Cannell. Uh, we have to understand uh, the main issue. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, uh, I have to say that global uh, health, this is a global health problem, commoner than what we are thinking about. So we have to promote the awareness about the vitamin D. Enough sound exposure is needed. Adequate intake of fortified food uh, in the diet and supplementation is another right choice. Actually, yesterday was the vitamin D day. Today is the 3rd November, but the 2nd November is the vitamin D day. So I'm talking the topic on the eve of the vitamin D day. So learn, you learn, you educate, educate your patient, and you participate in this program. What you can uh, do, we learn more about vitamin D and educate and participate the, our patient. Do yourself a favor, have more vitamin D and enjoy a delightful life. Thank you very much for your patient sharing. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Islam, for that interesting uh, talk. So shall we move on to the next lecture? Next talk uh, will be on hyponatremia. It is a common clinical practice. Dr. Claude Renaud will talk on hyponatremia. It is a case-based discussion. Over to you, Dr. Renaud. Good morning, all, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I thank the organizing committee, namely Professor Daka, for getting me down here. Now, um, the topic is a sodium imbalance in uh, patients who get admitted to the hospital. I, I think this is a wrong slide. So it's a, a problem that you commonly come across in, in the hospital setting. And I come from um, 
from a hospital that has a, a very big uh, geriatric footprint. And as you can see also, we have an abundance of water. You can see the, uh, the lake, the man-made lake in front of the, our outpatient department. And also we have an underground waterfall as well. So it's not surprising that sodium problem is actually something we do see currently in Kute Pad where, where, where I work. And these are our learning objectives. So let's start with a case. So this is a 78-year-old female who comes in disoriented in ED at about 10 p.m. She's taking Hyzar Forte. So of note, she's hypotensive, uh, ECG shows the U-waves, and she has hyponatremia and hypokalemia. We don't have clickers, so I guess I'll have to answer the questions myself, but you can take some time to think through that. Uh, option A is that uh, we have about five options, so, so which of the one here would be the incorrect answer? Serum osmolality, urine sodium, urine osmolality can categorically differentiate the causes. She should be started on 2 liter normal saline with 20 millimoles KCL per, per, lit, per half liter over 24 hours. Hyzer forte is an unlikely cause. She should be started on three cycles of KCL and one liter normal saline and 10, 100 mils of 3% uh, saline, or none of the above. So the option C is uh, E, but in ED, the ED physician decides on taking option D, giving three cycles of KCL, half a liter of saline, and 100 mils of 3% saline to control the patient's symptoms. And these kind of cases actually should be admitted uh, in HDU. Four hours later, further labs come through. We find that the urine osmolality is high, the serum osmolality is low, urine sodium is high, and thyroid and cortisol functions are both normal. A repeat sodium shows an increase of five millimoles. Blood pressure and ECG has normalized. So as a clerking resident, you correctly ascribe the cause to Hyzar forte, which is a combination of uh, losartan and hydrocortazai. But you're worried about dehydration, so you decide on giving a further two liters of uh, normal saline over the next 24 hours. On the 8 a.m. round with your boss, you find that the patient is drooling and she cannot move all limbs. Blood pressure is normal. She has made about 600 mils of urine now. Her sodium is now about 122. So that's another 14 millimoles increment from the baseline. So what would you do? Which one here is the wrong option? You'll keep her kneel by mouth. You'll, suggest a, you'll do an MRI of the brain. you look for causes of SIDH. You'll monitor her urine output hourly. You'll immediately stop the normal saline and give her desmopressin. So option C is obviously not the right option. So let's talk about hyponatremia. What is hyponatremia? So that's when you have a serum sodium of less than 135. But back, way back in 1968, Edelman realized that actually plasma sodium correlates very well with uh, plasma osmolality. So if you are talking about plasma sodium concentration, you're actually talking about plasma osmolality. But the major determinant there is not sodium. It's actually the total body water. And so if you have hyponatremia, and as an extension, you have hypoosmolality, most of the time it's actually due to an increment in your total body water. And total body water can go for a lot of reasons. As you know, in women it's about 50%, in males about 60%. It can go up because you've taken extra water, especially hypotonic or any form of hypotonic fluids, or you are unable to achieve acaresis. You cannot pass urine. And you, can, you will not be able to pass urine for two reasons, either because you have too much ADH secreted appropriately because of dehydration or volume contraction, or ADH is secreted uh, inappropriately. It's rarely a sodium problem. So let's look at how the, the, the nephrons uh, regulate uh, sodium and water. So this is a cartoon of the nephron. We have here the proximal convoluted tubule, the, distal, the thick ascending uh, loop of Henle, the distal covalent tubule together with the, the proximal collecting duct, which is a, a complex, and then we have the distal collecting duct. So sodium absorption takes place not because of uh, differences or imbalances in the sodium concentration. Sodium absorption takes place because of volume contraction. So if you are hypotensive, your sympathetic activity will go up, you will produce more angiotensin too, so you will maximize sodium absorption at the proximal tubule. But that solution that you absorb is actually very isotonic to your, to your plasma. 
And as you move further down the tubule, you go more distally, there will be further sodium absorption at the distal convoluted tubule, mainly through the thiazide sensitive channel, the, the triamterine and amyloride epithelial sodium channel, and the aldosterone sensitive sodium KTPAs. So the fluid that finally gets into the collecting duct actually is a very diluted fluid. So what you have effectively is a form of desalination. But you need to get that fluid back into your, into your plasma, otherwise that patient will be dehydrated. So that's where uh, you need to have on your collecting duct certain channels called aquaparins, and it's mainly aquaparin too, that will get that water back. That water will never get back into your serum unless you can generate a certain high tonicity in your um, medullary interstitial capillary bed. And this is achieved by this pump here called the sodium, K, uh, the sodium, chloride, sodium to chloride K channel, which is the fluzomide sensitive channel. If you don't generate that hypertonicity, water cannot cross uh, from the uh, collecting duct lumen into the vascular bed. How do you generate the aquaparins? And that's what ADH does. And ADH usually can be simulated by a number of factors, whether hemodynamic or osmotic. And certain non-osmotic factors can generate it. Pain, nausea, drugs, and so forth. So in so doing, if you have ADH, you will then produce a urine which is very concentrated. It can go as high as 1,200 uh, million small per kg of osmolarity. Or if you don't have ADH, then you will produce a very diluted urine. So in effect, your urine osmolality can actually be a good biomarker for ADH activity. But why do we worry about hyponatremia? When your, your plasma osmolality is very low, you have excess water, that water needs to move into the cell. Okay? If it goes into your muscle, it's not a problem. But going into your brain, which is confined in a very tight space in your caparium, that can lead to cerebral edema, cerebral edema uncle herniation, and even death. In the more long term, and this is something which is coming more vogue now, especially in Adali, there are issues also with cognitive impairment, gait disturbances, uh, osteoporosis, and fractures. Now, if you don't have aquaporins at your, base, uh, your, uh, your blood brain barrier, the excess water in your intravascular compartment cannot move into the brain. In fact, it's been shown in rats who have knockout aquaporins, if you reduce their serum osmolality, they don't get uh, cerebral edema. There are certain patients who are more at risk, especially pregnant ladies, uh, not pregnant ladies, but perimenstrual ladies who have very high progesterone, which makes their astrocytes more permeable. They, have, they generate more aquaporins and therefore more at risk for uh, cerebral edema. But the brain cannot sustain cerebral edema, like I said before, it and, uh, otherwise it undergoes an uh, neural, uh, uh, and colonization. So it must get rid of this uh, excess water. And how it does so? It does so within about 48 hours. And that's why there's this cutoff of 40 hours for, uh, between acute and chronic hyponatremia. So you, it will eject certain osmolite, starting with sodium, potassium, and ultimately things like taurine, glutamine, phoscreatinine, and myositol. In our patient, she's in a more of in a state of equilibrium whereby you have a bit of acute and chronic hyponatremia. At times she's asymptomatic, at times she's asymptomatic. Now, if you were to actually put uh, one liter of normal saline, and as you know, normal saline is isotonic to your serum, but if you actually you look at the concentration, it's actually 154 millimoles. But why so? That's because it's a way sodium distributes into your plasma. Your plasma has a virtual compartmentalization of non-aqueous and an aqueous phase. The aqueous phase is about 97%, non-aqueous phase is about 7%. So if you look about 97%, 93% of your 154, that's about 140 moles. That concept is in very important because most uh, sodium uh, analyte actually uh, factor that 93% when they do it, whether it's uh, indirect photoshenometry or whether it's uh, flame photometry. That concept is important to garner so that you can understand how pseudohyponatremia happens. So in pseudohyponatremia, essentially what you have is you have, a, you have a reduction in your aqueous phase. Let's say if it goes down to 80%, you will have 154 times 80%, that's about 120. But the sodium measured is actually that level, but your actual sodium is normal. There are a number of causes of things that can actually can reduce your aqueous phase, 
If you have myeloma, if you have uh, trigosideremia, you have uh, high-dose IVIG, all these can lead to so-called pseudohyponatremia. But essentially, the plasma osmolality is normal. There's no excess water. Your total body water is the same. There's no water shift. And this is what the most textbook will call an isosmolar hyponatremia. There's another form of hyponatremia called translocational hypotremia, whereby you have a very osmotic agent in your uh, ECF. And that agent, if it doesn't cross the biomembrane because of its high osmolality, it can actually pull water out of your intracellular fluid compartment. And that water will then dilute your sodium. A number of agents can do that, namely glucose, glycine, uh, sorbitol, mannitol, and others. In fact, you can tell how much your hyperglycemia is contributing towards your uh, hyponatremia by using the, the CATS correction. It, urea doesn't do that because urea can crisscross the, the biomembrane very effectively. So it's not uh, effective or small. It has high osmolarity but no tonicity. So it does not change sodium concentration. In most of these instances of translocational hyponatremia, the serum osmolality is high. And this is what the textbook will call a hyper or smaller hyponatremia. Cerebral edema does not take place unless if you metabolize the, the, the substrate or you push that substrate into the cell. For instance, if somebody with uh, DKA, you're giving IV insulin, you push the insulin, you push the glucose into the cell, the water will then follow and lead to uh, cerebral edema. So what can you use as a diagnostic approach to hyponatremia? Well, there are some cases which are Obviously, you can tell, obviously, clinically. For instance, patients with congestive heart failure, chronic liver disease, or hypothyroidism. This would be called a hypovolemic hyponatremia. Or you can tell when somebody has Addison's disease. If the patient has very frank volume contraction, also you can tell by looking at all the telltale signs. And this would be called a hypovolemic hyponatremia. But there are certain instances where hyponatremia can be very challenging clinically, especially patients who have subtle volume contractions, uh, patients who take very small amount of, of solutes and small amount of fluids, the so-called tea and toast uh, uh, syndrome, elderly on tazides, uh, syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, which textbook will call a euvolemic hyponatremia, or in the neurosurgical ward, patients with uh, cerebral salt wasting, pregnant ladies with recessed osmostat, or patients who've taken an inordinate amount of water, they've increased their total body water. Commonly seen in marathon uh, runners because if you're running for 42K and you're getting half a liter of fluids every 5K, you're more likely to develop, to increase your total body water. Perioperative patients who are kneel by mouth, they are stimulating ADH because they are in pain, they are getting anesthetic drugs, and they are on a very hypotonic fluid, so also are prone to uh, hyponatremia. Sometimes the causes can be very multifactorial. I'm gonna leave out the soul losing nephropathy because to the nephrologist, uh, this entity does not exist. Now, can urine osmolality and sodium, uh, urine sodium uh, help you in your diagnosis? Now, let's look at those four broad categories which, uh, like I showed you earlier, are a little bit less difficult to detect uh, clinically. The only entity whereby those two indices help would be actually patients who are taking excess water because in, in that instance, your, serum, your urine osmolality and your urine sodium would be very low. It does not help much with SIDH, although uh, a number of authorities will say your sodium and your osmolality in the urine will be very high, as there's a, quite a huge overlap with, uh, with, with dehydration itself. Now, a little bit on SIDH, you need to ex exclude a lot of things. But importantly, what you find is that the uric acid and the urea are very low because you have a very high fractional excretion of, of those two elements. Okay? There's a variable ADH level, so you should not be using ADH level or any other surrogate assays like copeptin to, to detect the level. The, tripten, the treatment currently, a standard treatment would be tolvaptan, but you look at the cost, $438 per tablet, uh, beyond the reach of most uh, patients in resource uh, challenge uh, uh, settings. Uh, it has some issues as well, can affect the liver, can lead to acoresis, can lead to overcorrection, and can also interact with certain drugs. Oral urea has come back recently on a paper in, 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 in states. Water restriction not so effective, can only push up your sodium by about one to two millimoles per day. 
Now, the problem with SIDH is it's overdiagnosed. It overlaps a lot with tazide-induced uh, hyponatremia. So if you're going to rely on your increased urine sodium, on your increased uh, urine osmolality, or your ratio of your urine uh, sodium and potassium to your serum sodium of less than one, you're going to be misdiagnosing quite a bit. To me, the best approach is you give the patient fluid. If the sodium goes down, then you know that is SRDH. Now, our patient had actually osmotic demyelination syndrome. Why did, why did this happen? And what is osmotic demyelination syndrome? So this is due to a rapid overcorrection of hyponatremia. You have, you subject the astrocytes to hypotonic stress. They are damaged, the blood-brain barrier gets damaged. You get desiccations of your, your, your neuronal elements in, your, in both your, your pons and also in, in, in your extrapontine area. And this is clearly sh shown here by this uh, sagittal uh, T1 uh, showing a pontine uh, ODS here. And here showing the, uh, on T2, you have hyperintense lesion in the basal ganglia in extrapontine site. Okay. But for you to understand ODS, you need to also understand your fluids. Know which of your fluids are isotonic and know which one of your fluids are hypotonic and which ones are hypotonic. So why was sodium overcorrected after 10 hours of treatment? So let's go back and have a look. 100 mils of 3% saline, 1.5 liters of normal saline. That's about 280 mmol of sodium front-loaded in ED and ED HDU. So for somebody about 60 kg, you've actually pushed up the sodium by about 9 millimoles. You expect to push it up by about 9 millimoles. But what we actually saw was a 14 millimoles increment. So where did these extra 5 millimoles came from? So the reason is that if you're going to co correct hypokalemia, you're going to correct potassium, you actually are giving sodium. So every molar equivalent of potassium you give, you're actually pushing one sodium into, the, into your ECV. Okay, so you have to be uh, a cognizant of that. If you are correcting the hypotension, you're also pushing up the sodium. Why? Because when you are hypotensive, your extra uh, cellular volume is actually contracted. ADH is at its peak. You have reduced aquaresis. But once you uh, correct the volume, all the, the volumetric uh, receptors are now toned down. ADH secretion is reduced, and you are now going to have uh, overt aquaresis your total body water will go down and you will have a rebound increase in sodium. So it's important to closely monitor the, so the, the, the urine output. In fact, it can be argued that for every three meals per kg or per hour of acaricis, your sodium increase goes up by about one millimole per hour. So what should have been the correct management of this patient? Treat the thing that will kill the patient first, address the potassium, give three cycles, give two cycles of potassium over two to three hours, Treat the hypotension with a fluid which is isotonic to that patient's current sodium of 108. Okay, we'll come to that in a minute. Because if you do this, you will correct the blood pressure, you will switch off the ADH without effectively giving more sodium to the patient. Recheck the, the sodium again. If you feel the patient is still symptomatic, or the, so the, the, the delta sodium has gone up by less than four millimoles, maybe give 100 mils of 3% uh, saline. We'll come back to 3% saline in a little while. Repeat the sodium again. And remember this, it's about repeating. It's not about using formula. It's about checking, reevaluating the patient all the time. Watch your urine output. This patient should be in a HDU setting. They should be having a urinary catheter as well. Um, in fact, you should be sometimes checking the sodium two to three, four times a, a day. Okay? and be prepared to use desmopressin if you think you've overshot. Okay. So this, this table actually is from uh, Dr. Stern, who is in Canada. So uh, it's, it's from his website, his blog. So this is how it works. So how you choose a, a fluid which is isotonic to your serum. So let's say if your sodium is 117, and you want to give potassium, and you don't want to add additional sodium to that, that patient. So the fluid you will give as a resuscitating fluid actually will be half saline. So if the, the, the sodium is 108, and you want to give uh, 20 millimoles of potassium as part of your rehydrating fluid. So the, the fluid you should be giving should be a combination of 20% normal saline and 80% uh, half saline. So when can we use 3% um, saline? Obviously, when the patient is acutely uh, symptomatic, let's say a marathon runner who has taken about five liters of water over, over, over two hours of, of running, or any form of symptomatic uh, hyponatremia. More so in patients with SIDH because you don't want to give a lot of volume, you just want to give more sodium at the expense of less volume. 
So what it does, it increases your sodium, by, uh, one mils per kg will increase your, your sodium by about one millimole. There are different ways of giving it. You can give it as an infusion or you can give it as a bolus. You don't need a central line for it. So how do we deal with the specter of uh, osmotic demyelination syndrome? Know the patients who are at risk. And our patient actually had three risk factors. She was uh, hypokalemic, she was elderly, had taken thiazide, and sodium was actually quite low. You can also argue that she was probably malnourished. So for the high risk patients, try and get that sodium up by only six millimoles in 24 hours. And be prepared to use a prophylactic uh, desmopressin. If you think the patient is low risk, you can allow a larger margin of uh, increment. And if you feel you've overcorrected, the patient is well, no symptoms, try and bring it down. The traditional way of doing this is actually to give 5% dextrose, but there's, there's no harm in giving desmopressin as well. So we move on to talk a little bit, uh, I think we still got a bit of time, we can talk a little bit about hypernatremia. So this is an, another case, you are asked to see an 88-year-old uh, bedbound female on NG feeding with history of hypertension. She's confused, you find that she's dehydrated, she's hypotensive, and the sodium is 160. The K is normal, and the uricotin ratio also is a bit high. High serum osmolality, the urine sodium is 15, urine K, 80, and urine osmolality is very high. Her urine bag, last drain 24 hours ago, has about 100 milliliters of urine, and city brain is unremarkable. So what is the least likely cause of her problem? So it's unlikely going to be diabetes insipidus here. Why? A high urine osmolality and a urine osmolality uh, greater than plasma osmolality exclude diabetes insipidus. What it suggests is actually there's a lot of ADH at work there. In uh, diabetes insipidus, ADH is not or inadequately acting. So your urine osmolality would actually be lower than your plasma osmolality. So essentially, hyponatremia is the, is the counter to hyponatremia. The sodium is more than 150. So it's more of a water deficit than a sodium excess. You will not find it in normal people walking around who are deep sick or able to, to, to drink because thirst is the best defense against hypernatremia. Okay? The moment your plasma osmolality goes more than 285, ADH will kick in so that then you can conserve more water. And that will also stimulate the thirst receptors. Absence of uh, or inability to appreciate thirst, uh, aphasic patients, stroke patients, or inability to say, look, I'm thirsty on itself, may lead to uh, hypernitremia. And this, and this picture here is a very interesting, because what, what they did was they used rats actually who, in whom you can actually stimulate the, uh, the thirst and the osmoreceptors by using certain uh, laser simulators. So you can actually induce a, a form of uh, neurogenic uh, DI, depending on how you stimulate it. And you will find that actually those, those rats who in whom you are induced hypertitremia actually do run for the water if, if their thirst receptor is actually intact. So hypernitremia, more problem of loss of uh, water. Um, so how this happens, you can lose water from, uh, from the gut, from the urine, or from the skin, or you may have inadequate ADH. Or in some rare cases, in, in pregnant women, they may produce this uh, hormone called vasopressinase from the placenta, which will break down ADH. This would be called a hypovolemic or hypovolemic uh, hypernitremia. <coughs> Alternatively, you can have excess uh, salt intake, either hydrologically or deliberately. Uh, sodium, uh, I mean, sodium bicarb is used as an alkalinizing agent in a number of instances, tripesin saline as an irrigant citrate dialysis in the ICU, senior drowning, and there are patients also who've come in because they've taken uh, a lot of salt to, to, to chase away the spirits as well. This will be called a hypervolumic hypernatremia. You are running out of time. So a good history is important if the, if the urine is, is very dilute, okay? Ask about drugs, look for causes of hypokalemia, hypercalcemia. And if there's a brain injury, you want to think about ne ne neurogenic uh, DI as well. Is there a role for water deprivation? I think if you are the, the resident on the service, you're asked to this, uh, I think it's just your bad day because this is something that uh, very barbaric. But I'll tell you, there's, a, there's another option. You don't need to wait for the sodium to normalize. If, if the sodium is high, just give the patient desmopressin and check the urine osmolality before and after. 
So if you give desmopressin, you find that the post uh, desmopressin urine osmolality has gone up, so you're probably dealing with a central uh, DI. Okay. Be caution, just like in hyponatremia, uh, hypernatremia, there's a that brain adaptation, but it's the opposite. You actually get uh, a cerebral desiccation. Um, and if you correct it after the brain has adapted, you can actually get cerebral, and you overshoot, you can actually get cerebral edema. So the principles of management, I think we, uh, yeah. So I think I, I will probably skip the, the management part, but the important is you need to, co to, to work out the total the water deficit and also to look at insensible uh, salt uh, water loss as well so that you can come up with uh, the actual volume for you to replace. And this volume can actually be replaced mainly uh, orally via NG tube, free water, uh, with some uh, half saline or even 5% uh, dextrose. So in summary, uh, dysnitremia is a very challenging issue. You need to understand the physiology. You need to understand how EDH works. It's not so much of a sodium problem, but a water problem. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Renaud. So we'll move on to the third uh, talk of the symposium. So every, each and every patient we encounter with critical illness have got uh, acid-based derangement. So uh, I, I will call upon Dr. Ra Rashan Hanifa to talk on acid-base imbalance. Over to you. Right, coming on automatically. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, thank you to Professor Rajapaksa and the Council for inviting me to give this talk. A pleasure. Um, yes. Might be slightly alarmed to know that the person who was meant to give this talk was the person who supervised my PhD. Never a good start, is it? So I am the stand-in, but a more official stand-in. So respected teachers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've um, been thinking about what I might say as an intensive care doctor looking after patients uh, who have acid-base derangement, as the chairperson alluded to, on a regular basis. I'm sure you all have a system of interpreting and understanding acid-base balance, and I think my role would be not to give you another system or try to give you another, um, another approach to looking at that. So I kind of thought maybe I'll start with a couple of messages which resonate in my mind when I look after unwell patients and maybe focus on a couple of things which are nuanced in terms of understanding acidemia and how that might help with clinical management. So the first thing I'd like to say is a little plea. So as an intensivist or intensive care doctor, quite often you get a bit of number voyeurism. People pick up the phone and they want to tell you that they've got this patient with this number. It's usually either a pH or, as the colleague from previously alluded, some sodium. They want you to be impressed by a number that there is a pH of 7.1 or we've got this patient. It's much more important to understand why and what the patient is than the individual number you're being told. And that leads a lot to um, misunderstanding and over-treatment. And I think you saw some examples of how the sodium, which was probably a problem and was symptomatic by its derangement, was then worsened by the treatment provided. And you see a lot of that in terms of acid-base balance. So that's kind of one plea. And second, directly leading from that, is to try and think when you see an acid-base derangement, how is this affecting the patient? Because, okay, the number is abnormal, we recognize that, but how is that affecting the patient? The reason I say that also is people commonly think acid-base balance is very tightly regulated by the body. I would like to suggest that's a little bit of a myth. Because if you, if you have a pH of 7.4, the way the logarithmic scale is set up. That gives you a hydrogen ion concentration of about 40 nanomoles per liter. When the pH is 7.2, I don't know whether it will surprise you if I tell you the hydrogen ion concentration is now 64 nanomoles per liter. So in fact, the Hydrogen ion concentration has changed by more than 
And this is not an unusual patient in the hospital. I suggest if you took blood gases from your patient you see on a day-to-day -day basis, this is not unusual. It's certainly not unusual in the patient population I deal with. So perhaps the pH or the hydrogen ion concentration is not that tightly regulated. And that directly leads to my first point about try to understand how this alteration in hydrogen ion concentration is actually impacting the patient. So for example, a person with COPD who has a pH of seven is very different from a person with diabetic ketoacidosis who has a pH of seven. And I think that's really important and perhaps you might see that theme as we try and discuss a couple of examples. So the theme I decided to try and touch on during this little talk is maybe an anion cap. And I thought maybe that's a good thing to highlight and maybe provide a little approach to how you might interpret changes in the anion gap and how you might anticipate and understand compensation in terms of an anion gap and how that as clinicians that might give you a little more information to treat this patient. So I thought maybe I'll work through a couple of examples, maybe a third one. I'm just trying to see that this comes up. So in this patient, if I told you these are kind of the numbers, I'll let you have a little look at those numbers. So this patient is obviously quite unwell, not dissimilar to the patient uh, who gets referred when you work in an intensive care unit, pretty unwell. And a common question, is there an anion gap? You might ask, how is that important? Maybe I'll try and highlight that in a moment. So, so what is an anion gap? The anion gap is talking about the difference between measured cations and measured anions. Looking to see, um, we don't, the, the screen doesn't come up here. Oh, sorry, it's me being blind, thank you. Um, so it does show the difference between the measured cations and the measured anions, and there is a component of measured anion, unmeasured anions, which contribute to this anion gap. Predominantly, it is the proteins and the sulfate. Now another important thing when we understand that is that there is a compensation required to interpret the anion gap if the proteins are low because a lot of the anion gap is contributed by these proteins. If the albumin is low, for every 10 grams of albumin below the normal level, you do need to make an allowance for the anion gap of 2.5 milliequivalents. Now, you might think that's not so common in patients, but, but in the critically unwell patients, you will not be surprised to think that's quite common. You see this albumin derangement quite often, and as we know, that doesn't always correlate with survival. So, if the anion gap is high and the pH is low, then that this patient does have a metabolic acidemia. And I thought maybe I'll focus on that and try and illustrate a couple of examples which show how that varies in these patients and how the anion gap might inform your interpretation. So if the anion gap is high, there is a metabolic acidemia with a low pH, and the bicarbonate is not low. Because if you go back to this equation, if the bicarbonate is not low and the anion gap is high with the metabolic acidemia, it does mean there is another disorder present. And going to the strong ion difference, which I'm not going to try and describe, it includes derangements in chloride are likely. And touching on the previous speaker's comments, it might be because we have resuscitated someone with lots of chloride, which is now causing a hyperchloremic acidemia, again, which you will be able to detect by looking at the anion gap in this way. So if that is the case, may I then propose a slight advance 
you might want to look at the anion gap in relation to the bicarbonate. So how has the bicarbonate changed in relation to the change in the anion gap? So that's a delta anion gap divided by delta bicarbonate. So how this helps us is if this change, if the bicarbonate change doesn't directly tally the anion gap change, it alerts us that there is something else going on. And maybe I will use a couple of examples to highlight that. And you can see if, if the ratio is one, you can be fairly confident that this is a high anion gap acidosis and what you're seeing is probably representative, the bicarb is representative of the problem and you will be able to interpret that relatively easily and be confident that there is no second disorder, no second metabolic disorder to be precise. However, if the ratio is not one is to one, then perhaps there is another metabolic disorder going on in this metabolic acidemia. Why do I say that? Perhaps you'll see. Maybe this is a medical school acronym, uh, mud piles. Again, just an acronym to try and illustrate the causes of a high anion gap acidemia, quite often asked in examinations, and a kind of a good acronym to work your way through once you spot that somebody has a metabolic acidemia with a high anion gap, and that includes things like cyanide. So going back to our example of the gentleman we were discussing, so this patient does have an anion gap which increased. It is 18. If we consider 12 as the normal for the upper normal limit for anion gap for this calculation and example, we can say there is a derangement, and if we do the delta anion gap divided by the delta bicarbonate, if we take the lower level of the bicarbonate as 24, then you can see that the ratio is one is to one. So I'm not going to touch on the osmolar gap. I don't want to confuse and make this more complicated. So I'll pass that for the moment. But if I just work through this, I'm sure you all appreciate there is an acidemia and it's now pretty obvious there is a metabolic acidemia. So is there any compensation? Again, I'm sure you all have your own way of working that particular bit out. But I think it's suffice to say if the direction of the CO2 is in the opposite direction to benefit the acidemia, then there is compensation. So in this case, I think you can see there is respiratory compensation. And I want to touch maybe you can also try and predict the extent of compensation. Now, this kind of number helps me interpret a blood gas because it helps me understand that for every CO2 coming down by 1.2, so if there's a metabolic acidosis and there is a reduction of bicarbonate by a millimole, that will be followed by a CO2 reduction of 1.2 millimeters mercury. That's the kind of compensation you are expecting. So if you're looking at a blood gas, and in this patient, we saw the bicarbonate had changed by six millimoles, then you're expecting a change in CO2 of about eight millimoles. I don't know whether that makes sense. So if you now look at that patient, it does suggest there is a compensation. It is a respiratory compensation. And if we look at the ratio, we can be fairly confident that this is just an anion gap acidemia. So if I, I'm just gonna go through, skip the AA gradient, not to make this any further complicated, but if we now think what the diagnosis may be, I hope it will not come as a surprise to you that this person has a high anion gap metabolic acidosis with some respiratory compensation and there is a high lactate. 
and that's causing the acid-base disturbance. If I move on to another example to maybe show a slightly different nuance to what I have now illustrated. So this patient is an asthmatic patient who's presented to emergency, um, has been using an inhaler quite often, the asthma has been getting worse and is now in hospital. So again, some blood gas results for you to consider with an oxygen-inspired oxygen concentration. So this patient does have an AA gradient, an alveolar arteriolar gradient. And like I said, I'm not going to go into that, but perhaps you'll concentrate on the acid-base disturbance and think about those numbers we discussed and how you might go about interpreting that in your own mind. So as I work through that, again, is there an anion gap in this patient? Yes, there is and the anion gap is 17. So going back to our concept of can we try and see whether the bicarbonate is following this change in anion gap, you can see the change in anion gap is five, but the bicarbonate change is only three. And therefore we should be wary that there is perhaps a metabolic process in addition to what we are seeing. I pass through the osmolar gap again. So just trying to work through this, is there, is, an, is there an acidemia? Yes, there is. Is the primary derangement respiratory or metabolic? Again, I hope it won't come as a surprise to you, given the extent of the pH derangement and given the extent of the CO2 being high. This is obviously a respiratory acidemia at its source, and given the history correlating to what we have heard of the patient. Again, I hope it will also be not a surprise to you that this patient is very unwell, an asthmatic patient with this kind of CO2 causing this kind of acidemia is very unwell, and you would say that this is near life-threatening asthma if not already requiring very, very urgent intervention. So is there compensation? So going back to our previous calculations, if we kind of think of the numbers, is there compensation? Going back to our equation of expected compensation, if there is an acute respiratory acidosis, we expect a bicarb to go up by one millimole for every 10 millimeters mercury. This is the other way around to what we discussed earlier. So we want the bicarb to have gone up, but in this patient, you can see the bicarbonate is actually lower than normal. So does that mean there is no compensation? No, it doesn't mean that. It means there is a compensation because if you go back to our conversation about the anion gap, it suggests there is a metabolic acidemia. And if we went back and looked at the ratio, we expected the bicarbonate to have reduced by at least five in relation to the anion gap acidemia. However, it hasn't, and in fact, the bicarbonate is only three lower than what you would expect. So in this patient, what you're having is an additional metabolic process. So again, I hope it will not come as a surprise to you in an asthmatic patient who's breathing very fast and very hard, there is a strong element of hypovolemia. And you see these in these patients. So the metabolic, the, the acidemia you're seeing may be mixed and is quite often mixed. How is that important? When you try and intervene with this patient, whether that is an intubation or whether that is trying to rescue, some people might try something like non-invasive ventilation. I suspect the patient we are discussing is beyond that stage. But, but if you were to try and intervene, you have to understand the metabolic derangement you are seeing may be more than the respiratory element. 
and I think these are very good example to interrogate the numbers you're seeing a bit further. So if the CO2 being high is not reflected in the bicarbonate change in relation to the anion gap, it alerts us to think that there is perhaps a metabolic element going on <coughs> despite the compensatory efforts. I realize that's a little tricky to convey in a talk like this. I understand it's a little tricky, but I hope uh, that alerts you in your mind when you try to interpret derangement in acid-base balance to consider the anion gap and to consider whether the bicarbonate has followed the change in the anion gap. And if it hasn't followed that change, perhaps be alert there might be another process going on, whether that causes an increased anion gap acidemia or a non-increased anion gap acidemia. I hope that conveys a little bit. I, I do understand it's a little tricky to convey this kind of thing in a talk like this, so apologies for, for trying. So just going back, is there another disorder present? Yes, there is, and the other disorder is metabolic. And quite often, what is this disorder in this patient? I just rushed through that a little bit. As I said, you get increased work of breathing, you get anaerobic metabolism, and you get a significant element of hypovolemia. And when you intubate these patients or you try to treat them, they are far more unstable than they appear. And that's very important in the restratification and management of these patients. And, and quite often, people who haven't recognized this metabolic derangement are the people who walk into that unanticipated challenge. So perhaps that's helpful in understanding that. So this patient does have an acute respiratory acidosis. There is an element of compensation because the bicarbonate is as, not as low as it should be. And there is a metabolic acidemia going on with that. So I'll move on with that times coming up. So just to summarize, um, so I wanted to try and highlight a couple of things. Firstly, to say acid-base disturbance must be viewed in context of the patient. What do I mean by that is to try and understand how is this acidemia, which is the predominant problem people worry about in hospital, when they see an acid-based disturbance, how is that affecting this patient? What is the danger we are anticipating? And what is the evidence that danger is coming to pass? And how are we going to manage that? It then forces you to think, what is causing that acidemia? You then have the decision tree, is that high anion gap acidemia? or is it a normal anion gap acidemia? If it is a high anion gap acidemia, is the bicarbonate following the derangement you are seeing in that anion gap change? If it is not following that, then perhaps there is another metabolic process. And that is probably the take home message for this morning from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rashan, for your excellent talk. Now we can take a few questions, and it's open for questions. I'm uh, Professor Sarod Jaising, a professor of medicine, University of Colombo. Uh, it's a provocative but a serious question I want to ask the panel. We've had an excellent uh, plenary uh, and also a lecture by Professor Bell, who emphasized clinical, the importance of clinical skills. Now, on the other hand, you have the specialist coming up with these uh, various algorithms. My question is very simple, especially to Rashan. The, why can't this be given to us by a simple program which is inbuilt to the blood gas machine? So that, I mean, this is a simple algorithm. Uh, you do the analysis and you get a readout saying the differential diagnosis, and then the clinician just has to look at that and say, this supports us. Because sometimes the blood gas machines even do not give us the normal range for bicarb. I just can't understand why it doesn't. 
Rashan, put you in a spot. Thank you. I was going to say, when I started, I should have said no question from the start of it. <laughs> but, but since I didn't say that, I can't say that now. So let me try. So I completely agree. I couldn't agree more. What I would say is I think it's coming. And in fact, it's come in many places already. So if you, if you uh, look at your 12 BDCG, how many of you don't have it being interpreted already by the computer? So in Sri Lanka, I know it's that long lead ECG. Is it still that strip? Is it still that strip or is it a 12 lead in one sheet? Okay, so, so basically, in pretty much any uh, high-income country, when the computer does the 12 lead ECG, it now interprets it. There are Twitter and Facebook tags about wrong interpretation of the computer. But it's a start because it gives, basically, now the nurses, when they ring you, because it tells you left axis deviation, left ventricular hypertrophy, atrial fibrillation, it's already telling stuff. It can be wrong. It can get it wrong, but, but it's coming. In terms of the blood gas machines, the EHRs already have these flags. So maybe I propose a slightly uh, opposing question or comment. A lot of people, especially in the United States, have alert fatigue. They are irritated by the number of messages these computer systems give them, unasked for and unsolicited, disrupting what they think is their clinical mind. So I think there's a balance between that, but, but I completely agree that the darkness we seem to operate uh, is unnecessary because surely what I have proposed this morning um, is, a sim is a series of simple rules which can be interpreted and provided at the point of care by a computer. Whether the clinician agrees with that or disagrees with that, in my opinion, is a further advance and only a good thing. I don't see that as a problem. Some people, you know, some people see the devil in all of these things. They'll say, what if the computer says this person was hyperchloremic acidemia and they weren't? And you kind of think, at the moment, the computer's already telling you this person may be having atrial fibrillation. And maybe they are not. It is up to the clinician now to take that advice, because that may be a junior colleague telling you, or a computer, and to make an informed decision by looking at the patient. I don't know whether that helps. See, I seem to have been not talking into a working mic. Okay. There's another question. Uh, thank you very much for your talks, as I suppose there's a thread for me around understanding the pathophysiology is necessary to make the right diagnosis, at least, especially in difficult cases. And I suppose medical metabolic emergencies, not vitamin D, but metabolic emergencies are often poorly managed. Um, I think that would be certainly our experience in the UK. So my two, two points, one is in relation to the uh, sodium imbalance ones. Part of the reason you move them to HDU is to monitor them. And there's a concern for me that we do not monitor them frequently enough. Just like your comments on that, you suggested four or six hours. I wonder if that's frequently enough when people don't fully understand what they're doing. And the second thing is going back to your point. If we used an acid-based nomogram, that would probably cover 70 or 80% of our patients and it would teach them pathophysiology. So should we not just be encouraging people to use acid-based nomograms? Would you like to answer? Uh, thank you for your question. I think it's very interesting. But I, I'll, I'll also try and answer your question by referring also to the earlier comment and questions put across according, uh, based on whether you can introduce AI, artificial intelligence, in you know, making diagnosis when it comes to acid and electrolyte imbalances. Uh, my straight answer is actually no, because context matters, and I think cognition also matters. Every case is different. And I think if you don't take what I call a step back, take the eagle eye view and 
analyze all, all, all the portable scenarios that can happen, you're bound to probably make more mistake. And I think this was very clear, for instance, with this case of hyponatremia, whereby if probably you introduce some form of AI in your diagnostic algorithm, whereby you even have a detailed calculation of the infuse that you're supposed to infuse, and if you are not taking into account all the other parameters, urine output, you're still bound to make mistakes. So I think you still need somebody who's uh, cognitively attuned to the underlying pathophysiology. I think that that's key. Uh, rather than just solely relying on algorithm. Is it okay if I try? Do we have a minute or stop? Stop? Okay, so maybe I try. Um, so I, I completely agree with the, with the sodium point. So quite often, so I, I, I have two perceptions I'm happy to be disagreed with. The first is I suspect we have far less control of things like sodium control than we like to think as clinicians. That's kind of one perception I have as somebody who manages very deranged sodium numbers with a hypo or hyponatremia. I think we think we have far more control than we actually have. Happy to be challenged on that. Secondly, quite often the reason you admit someone to HDU is to stop people making things worse. Just stop. Because what happens is people intervene thinking they can control these numbers in a very fine way. And the level of monitoring required for that and the level of diligence and manpower and intensity and the clinician buy-in you need to achieve that is quite, quite a lot. And in my experience, looking at these patients, even in the intensive care unit, I have a little game in my mind. What I do is, when they admit someone with a sodium or a potassium imbalance, I kind of ask them, what are your targets for the next 24 hours? And then I just watch to see whether we achieve them or whether it's anywhere close to what we actually intend. And quite often, it isn't. So that's kind of a, um, a plea, maybe, to be a little, um, a little less ambitious in what we set out to achieve and be a little more aware of our limitations in achieving those targets. That's kind of one perception. And secondly, just to answer the question about the normogram, I definitely think for the non-expert, as they go on this journey to becoming the expert, because it does require the expert to guide those tricky, complicated patients, it does allow the non-expert a voice to raise, and it gives them a framework to work from, to engage with the expert and ask a question, because otherwise I find the gap between those two groups of people is far too big, because otherwise the experts are having the expert conversation, and the non-experts are not understanding what's going on. We can allow one more question, quick question. No other question, I thought I'll reiterate my position. I think uh, the, I'm thinking of artificial intelligence actually subservient to human intelligence in this instance. So that the clinician really sees the whole big picture and he wants from the blood gas machine just a guide because he's dealing with the blood gas, he's dealing with the blood glucose, he's dealing with the anemia and he's dealing with the renal failure and this is just one small area. So in that, you, the internist is in control, and he wants a bit of help from the different machines. So you actually, it's uh, human intelligence and the artificial intelligence playing a subservient role, because I'm a hardcore clinician. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, to wind up the uh, sessions, I will call upon Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Senaka Rajapaksha to give away uh, token of appreciations to all the speakers. <laughs> Dr. Claude Renaud. <laughs> Dr. Rashan Hanifa.